Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, the subject that we are looking to be digging a little, little deeper into today is what legacy will you leave planning for the generation next? And uh, it's one of those that is close to the hearts and minds of uh, many of our clients. And you know, it is on the top of uh, their minds as well. Um, this world that we live in today is one that was left for us by those before us. And those that come after us will be the recipients of what we leave behind. We have a responsibility to fulfill. Uh, we are stewards of this world and we have a calling to leave it better than how we found it. Even if it seems like you know, we better it only in a small part at times. Who or what constitutes that world? Uh, it could be as grand and wide as the planet or the continent or as intimate as our family, our children, grandchildren and future generations uh, to come. What is a legacy? Uh, I'll first tell you what it is not. A legacy is not what's left tomorrow when you're gone. It is what you give, create, impact, and contribute today while you are here that then happens to live on. That is what a legacy is uh, in, in my mind. And I think many of you will agree with, uh, with that. And uh, with this topic today, who better than our esteemed panel to take us through this journey of looking at the what, why, and how of creating a legacy that outlives us. So let me start by introducing our panel to you. First up, we have our founder and managing director, Mr. Ashok Sardana. A veteran of the profession, uh, Ashok has been advising clients on a range of financial service uh, solutions for over 40 years. He's worked extensively with high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals across the globe on all areas of life insurance and legacy planning. He brings deep expertise in both areas to present solutions to clients. A dynamic individual, uh, Ashok believes in leading from the front and is passionate about spreading financial awareness and the need for proper financial planning. Uh, he is also a lifetime member of the MDRT and has been a top of the table qualifier for the past 20 years. Um, our next panelist is from a partner for this evening, Quilter International, uh, Ms. Priyanka Roy Jivan. Priyanka has been with Quilter International for six years and was appointed as the head of global banking, sales and strategy in April 2019. She has over 17 years experience in the financial services, banking and insurance uh, in the international market, including uh, India, UAE, Singapore, Europe, Switzerland and UK. Priyanka is responsible for managing the banking distribution of uh, Quilter's international solutions to retail and professional investors via licensed financial institutions. Her priority is to build Quilter International's growth strategy, expanding the distribution opportunities and broadening the propositions to the H&W segment and wider audience. A specialist in investments with educational background in finance with Oxford University and a licensed financial analyst by the CFI, Priyanka also provides technical knowledge on wealth, conservation, and investment management. She's currently based in London and takes care of banking and H&W business distribution for Middle East, Europe, uh, and Europe with Quilter International. We also have with us uh, Ms. Neelam, who's the Vice President Head of Investments at Continental. Uh, Neelam is a seasoned finance and banking professional with over 23 years of experience across investments, private banking, and wealth. Uh, and wealth management, corporate and commercial banking, real estate finance, retail banking, and Islamic banking across both India and the UAE. She holds an MBA finance from uh, New Hampshire Col uh, College of, uh, in the US and is an advanced strategic management expert from the IIM Ahmedabad and also holds a mini MBA from Harvard Business School. She's a certified wealth manager from the American Academy of Financial Management uh, and the ICWM from the, with the CSI, from CISI UK. Uh, in addition to the several other qualifications uh, with the stock exchanges and various asset management companies that she holds, she's had a career spanning uh, multiple senior positions across the globe uh, with international local banks and financial institutions as well. Uh, we also have with us our Director and Vice President of Strategy and International Development, Mr. Akshay Sardana. An integral mem member of the team, Akshay manages the many facets of Continental Group's business growth and strategic partnerships. 
Having joined Continental over a decade uh, ago, Akshay brings a fresh international perspective to business strategy from his prior positions on the derivatives and fixed income desks at Citigroup New York. Akshay plays a key part in developing and maintaining global relationships with our banking partners, financial institutions, and insurance carriers. His current role as Vice President of Strategies and International Development focuses on the international expansion and business development of the group into foreign markets, including Asia, Africa, and Europe. So that's our, uh, our, our panel for the evening. And I'm sure uh, with the list of qualifications and the experience that we've got on board, it is going to, be, it is going to make for a very interesting uh, session. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, the seminar is scheduled to last for about 60 minutes. Uh, if for some reason you are discontinued during the session, you can rejoin using the same link. Uh, we will be making the session available as a recording. Uh, and if you drop in a line or your, uh, a message, we will send you the, uh, the link to that recording. Or you can always check on our YouTube channels or our social media pages to access uh, the recording of the same. Um, as uh, our team members mentioned, we are also live streaming this on Facebook and uh, some of our uh, other social properties. So um, you can always feel free to check out our social media channels. Uh, uh, towards the uh, latter half of the channel, we will have time for question and answers uh, from, uh, from our audience. So please do uh, feel free to look uh, and submit your questions uh, in the Q&A box that is available on your interface. All right, so that's it for housekeeping. And, um, uh, and we're very excited to kick off uh, the session with, uh, with our guest Priyanka uh, to give us a bit of an insight and introduction into Quilter and uh, the proposition that it offers. So Priyanka, we're gonna hand over to you to take us through that. Um, thank you, Anselm, um, for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope I'm visible. There's a bit of problem in the room with lights. But um, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for your time uh, for joining us today. And um, we will try to make it as uh, simple as possible. Um, and uh, please um, keep your questions uh, separate and let us know wherever clarification you require. We'll be happy to help. Uh, so to start with, um, I will take you through who we are sorry is the screen available can everyone see the screen yes the yes. screen is visible yeah thank you thank you Anselm. um so um we will cover today um who we are um who is filtered international and then during the later part of the session, we will talk about what are our products, what are our proposition, and how are we different in the market. So to take you through, who are we? Uh, Quilter International is basically a part of Quilter, uh, Quilter PLC, uh, based out of London. Previously, we were known as Old Mutual International. Uh, we got rebranded in February 2020 to align our name to our parent company, which is Quilter PLC. We are one of the leading cross-border providers of wealth management solutions um, established over 35 years um, in the industry. And we cater to over 40 countries, including Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and Middle East. Uh, we are there in the Middle East since 22 years, so pretty much old in the system. Um, we are a part of, um, we are a FTSE 250 company and we are listed with London Stock Exchange and Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, we manage over 107.4 billion of investments on behalf of 900,000 uh, 900, clients. And we have got a Fitch rating of A negative as on 30th June, 2020. Um, there's a lot to talk about our organization. Unfortunately, it cannot be completed in two slides. Um, but um, if you are there in the Middle East and you understand the Middle East market, uh, Quilter and Old Mutual International earlier known is very much um, there in the market and very trusted organization. Uh, with that, I will leave to the question answer round if later about the organization, I think I'll cover it um, over a period of time. Um, should we start with the product Anselm or should we? So 
sorry, my phone was muted there. No, uh, we will just go uh, to Akshay quickly. Um, you know, while uh, uh, you know, we are we're proud and happy to have Quilter as part of uh, this evening, so that we can uh, provide uh, our clients with the options. Uh, Quilter and Continental also have a rich history together, and I'd like Akshay to sort of uh, take our audience through a little bit of that. So, uh, Akshay. If you'd uh, like to sort of touch upon a little bit between uh, the, the association between uh, Continental and Quilter, and also dive into uh, some portion of you know what is legacy planning, why is it important, and uh, you know passing generation, uh, passing wealth uh, among generations as well. Uh, Akshay, Hi. thank you, Anselm, and thanks everyone again for joining us this evening. Um, about the relationship. Simply put, we choose our partners very carefully at Continental, and I'm happy to say we've enjoyed collaborating with Quilter International to help our clients secure their wealth. Our partnership of over 15 years might seem like a very long time, but when we zoom out and we're looking at building lifetime relationships with our partners and clients, this is just the beginning of very exciting things to come. Their support is world-class, and the solutions they offer truly add value to our clients' portfolios. You saw it in some of the statistics that uh, Priyanka shared on, on the screen, and also from our interaction with them at all levels, the client support, the relationship manager support, the operational support, it's there through and through, and uh, it's been fun working with them. And hopefully uh, you see a little bit more about our, our relationship as we go through the presentation and what we have to offer today. And you can see it's truly a collaborative effort to get the best solutions in front of our clients. Uh, and that's it about our relationship, but on to what are on, on the topic at hand, legacy planning. I think Anselm, you framed it beautifully uh, as to what it means to leave a legacy. I think the way you put it is implying that it's not what we, it's what we do today that has an impact on tomorrow. I think that is a, a beautiful way to frame it. And, and thank you for starting us off on that note. Legacy planning in the context of wealth management, simply put, is having a well thought through plan that ensures asset, uh, ensures asset protection and allows for the efficient transfer of wealth to future generations. We've all worked hard over our careers to generate our wealth, and with some creative planning, we can ensure that your estate stays, stays, stays secure. Um, sorry for the tongue twister there. There are many facets to holistic legacy planning, some of which may seem complicated, but with that right guidance, it can be straightforward and simple to structure efficient multi-generational legacy plans. Some of the components that are traditionally included uh, are trusts and foundations, flexible investments, universal life insurance, tax planning, charitable giving, and onshore and offshore implications of growing your wealth. Today, specifically, we'll be talking about one tool that allows you to grow your assets while offering you that full flexibility to control and ensure an efficient structuring and transfer of wealth. And I want to stress that future flexibility is a key component to a well-structured legacy plan. Um, before I ramble on too much, I'd like to leave you with two important facts before we actually start the presentation and get into the nitty gritty, uh, which I will refer to at the end of the session, but just something for you to think about and hopefully spurs on some, uh, some questions throughout the session. Today, we're living through one of the, we're living through the largest transfer of wealth in history from one generation to the next. That's happening right now across multiple continents. And when you couple that with the second fact, 70% of families will end up losing that wealth in the sec second generation due to improper planning. This is why having these conversations now and putting this plan in place is imperative. Just something to think about, not a hard stat, not a scary stat, but um, it, is, it is important to realize how, uh, how imperative these conversations are and utilizing the tools we have at our disposal to help us ensure that our wealth is transferred from, uh, to future generations and the impact we have is lasting. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to all, uh, all of you for attending. And uh, Priyanka, I think over to you, or Ashok, over to you. 
Yep, no, thank you, Akshay. I, I think that's uh, an important uh, consideration and question uh, that uh, that you mentioned. The statistic also is very interesting. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to go to Ashok uh, with regard to the similar uh, sort of for his thoughts on you know the importance of uh, of legacy planning. And what would the elements uh, that you would consider as as key uh, when we choose to pass on wealth? And, uh, and any personal stories that you'd like to share with regard to uh, yourself or your clients? Over to you. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you, Akshay. I'm going to be a little philo philo philosophical yeah. uh, in my uh, sharing my views on legacy planning. First is. Uh, Many a times I've gone to the clients. Uh, I, I enjoy meeting my clients. I go and sit with them. We talk about the future planning, et cetera. And many a times the clients have said, Ashok, if I leave so much of money uh, for my kids, they'll get spoiled. I don't want to leave so much of money. And I smile and say, um, ask them, so how much money should you leave for your children which will not spoil them? Can you tell me a figure that if I leave a million dollars, it won't spoil them. But if I leave $2 million, it's going to spoil them. So it is not the money which spoils uh, or which, uh, uh, which can hurt the, your, your future plans. It is the upbringing and it's the, it's the values that you have built in your family with your children. That is going to be, that's going to determine. So it is not the amount of wealth. And then I asked him, okay, you know, what are you going to do, do with your wealth? Are you going to take it with you? You can't. Whether it is a million dollars or a hundred, even, even uh, Elon Musk uh, being the richest man, he cannot take it with him. And neither can Bill Gates, nor, nor Warren Buffett, nor myself, nor anyone. So, so that is one. But having the legacy planning and during your lifetime, you know, when I'm gone, I don't know what's happening to my business. I don't know what's happening to my, but during my lifetime, I have the satisfaction and I have the, the joy of seeing that I have made provisions for my family. I have done the right thing so that my wealth is transferred the way I want to do it. It is, it is bringing values to my, in, in my family, to my children. It is making those provisions. You may have a will, you may not have a will. I mean, you have to have a will. But even when you have a will, you want to make sure that, that your wealth is transferred properly. I'm making enough provisions during my lifetime. And this has to be done now, not when I'm 65, 75 or 85. The planning has to be done now. So that I can enjoy that, yes, I have made the provisions and I have, I have done the right thing for my family. And like Akshay said, 70% of the wealth is going to be lost because of, of because it is not being planned properly. I have to take those steps now. Sometimes we get so caught up in our day-to-day -day affairs that yeah, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it the next day, and I'll do it next year No. Start, start planning now, start making those provisions, start making those changes now. Uh, and, and I think this is the best time. And uh, yeah, uh, look after your family. This is, this is a trying, trying time. Uh, look after your families and stay safe. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. I think uh, indeed uh, it's uh, well said. Uh, sometimes uh, we need that bit of insight and uh, perspective. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, uh, before we go to Priyanka uh, next, we're going to take a quick poll. We've got our team uh, ready to put up a poll for you. And it's an interesting one. Who should inherit my assets? Uh, and we've got a few options there. Your spouse, children, charity, parents. Uh, uh, so do, do select that and let us uh, have a insight into who do you think uh, should be the ones to inherit your assets. Uh, we'll come back to the responses of the poll in a bit, uh, but in the meantime, we'll head back over to Priyanka uh, to have a look at uh, the executive redemption bond and how that would sort of work in a manner to be able to 
uh, as an instrument to pass on wealth to the next generation. Uh, Priyanka? Um, thank you, um, Akshay and Ashok. Actually, you made the stage for me uh, when you talk about legacy because um, that is the beauty of the proposition that we offer other than the uh, technicalities in the product. Um, so while talking about the product, we talk a lot about, uh, we will talk a lot about uh, legacy planning and how our proposition can help um, clients to do their legacy planning. Um, so the name of the proposition is Executive Redemption Bond. Um, it's basically a open architecture platform um, that would help clients to hold any kind of asset classes that are bankable, um, whatever are available in the universe uh, to invest. Um, over a period of time, obviously they need to keep the money because it's a medium to long-term investment plan. And um, it is until age, not age, but until 99 years term. Um, so that is available for the clients. When I talk about um, any kind of asset classes, I mean um, bankable asset classes, which are bonds, mutual funds, shares, um, commodities, um, cash, everything that you can think of, of the universe that you can do in, um, in, in your investments are available in the platform. Uh, so this, this is the base of how the platform is built, basically. Other than that, this platform also enables clients to transfer and consolidate their existing assets. When I say transfer and consolidate their existing assets, I mean from anywhere in the world. It can be, your assets can be um, based in Geneva, in, in Zurich, in UK, in Europe, banks, anywhere in the world, you can transfer that, those assets to our platform and you can consolidate them. Um, I will touch legacy planning the last because there's where uh, we talk more about how our, our platform helps in legacy planning. Um, the clients have an option to choose and appoint their professional fund advisor. In, in this case, this is Continental Financial Advisor. Um, post this session, I'm sure that you will get in touch with your advisors and you will want to know more about the platform um, and in details. Um, so um, how, how does the platform work overall? Um, I can say, so as for example, if, you, if I'm talking about mutual funds, usually I know in the Middle East what happens is the platforms are any kind of platforms or any kind of plans are very restricted to only certain kind of asset classes. As for example, mutual funds only, wherein there would be say 400, 500 mutual funds available. In our platform, we have more than 55,000 mutual funds available. So you can imagine almost the whole universe is available. We have 35 stock exchanges enlisted in the platform. We have got 13, one, three major currencies that are available. So it's your choice really what you would like to buy and what you, what you would like to uh, hold in our platform. And all of these comes in a very economical cost, you may say, which I would cover in the later part of the um, session. So um, that's how a platform works. So in short, you go to your advisor, you, you want to understand exactly how you should build your platform, not only through one kind of asset classes, but I, I'll give you an example. What can be a better example than COVID times today when um, you know that um, you know, certain kind of asset classes are performing and certain kind of asset classes are, aren't. So this platform would actually give you um, the access to have a balanced portfolio wherein you can hedge against your um, asset classes and your um, portfolio would grow. So that is the kind of opportunity our platform gives you. Other than that, um, we have got expertise in tax planning as well. So it's a portable uh, platform. Uh, wherever, to, today you are in the Middle East, tomorrow you may go back to your countries. Um, you, can carry your, uh, you can carry executive redemption bond with you. Um, we can give proper tax planning based on that, what you are carrying back to your home country. And then very interesting point, which Ashok mentioned uh, just before some time that a um, few of his clients sometimes say that we don't want to give too much of money to our kids because they will get spoiled. And honestly, this is what even I hear from a lot of my clients and a lot of our distributors who say the same thing. 
there's a very good solution that even our proposition offers, which is called trust. So we have got our own trust company. You can ring fence your whole asset under our trust. And then based on that, our trust company, you can actually give directive as to what amount of money you would like to give to your kids at what point of time. So there may be instances wherein, as for example, at the age of you, you, you would be not comfortable giving million dollars of your asset at the age of 18 when, you're, when your kid um, you know, grows to the age of 18, maybe a very vulnerable age. You would want to distribute assets accordingly and what age, at what point of time, what amount of money should go to them. Even that is available. So trust planning is available in our platform as well. From there, I would like to talk a little bit about legacy planning. Um, that is a beauty of our uh, proposition. So once in the event of the death of the main policyholder, the assets, so as for example, if the beneficiary, I'll give you with example, maybe it will be easy for you to understand. If there are two beneficiaries, say a wife and the son or the daughter, after the death of the policyholder, 50-50% of their assets are basically transferred to them. Now, once again, great example today's time when COVID time, maybe few asset classes are not performing. And during this time, if you have to, if, if the policyholder, we are getting a lot of claims now, so we know exactly what's happening. Um, a lot of asset classes which are not performing, say, um, if that had to be redeemed today at loss, and then the money had to be given back to the beneficiaries, that would have been a problem because basically, there are a few asset classes which are maybe not performing at their best currently. So in our situation, what happens, we do not, the clients do not have to redeem those. They can actually transfer those assets to their beneficiaries, and then they have the choice to continue it for the next 99 years. So this is how a lot of business classes, I mean, we know a lot of business um, owners who would, love, would like to give their wealth back to the child and want, want to grow their wealth through uh, their generations, this is the best tool one can use um, as, as a, um, you know, a legacy planning. Um, with this, would like to cover a little bit about how much, what are the minimum uh, commitment to this um, plan. The minimum premium is 50,000 sterling, equivalent to $75,000. Um, Top-ups are very much available. You can do top-up any point of time, which is minimum of just 2,500 sterling, equivalent to $3,750. And the rest two are very much, um, obviously we are UK based, so we have um, tax planning for our UK expat clients. If there are any UK expat clients who are um, there right now in the panel, I would suggest please uh, contact your advisors after this session. Um, we can give you detailed and bespoke solutions for your tax planning um, for um, UK expats clients. Uh, so with that, I think I'll hand over to uh, Neelam. Sure, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I mean, there was an interesting point that you, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Priyanka, that uh, I'd like to sort of uh, uh, get uh, Neelam's view on as well. Uh, during your, uh, during the, you know, you mentioned that we are here in the Middle East and uh, the first thing that sort of comes to mind when you mentioned that, especially with the UAE, uh, is the local Sharia law. Um, and, you know, to be, to be able to, uh, to transfer wealth, taking into account Sharia law, uh, you know, Neelam, would you like to share your perspective on how that is something that we can do or we can provide or guide our uh, attendees on? Sure, Anselm, thank you. It's a very valid question. Uh, living out of the UAE in the Middle East, a lot of clients, a lot of friends come to me and ask me, what happens if, you know, tomorrow something happens to me? Uh, what happens to the bank account? What happens to my wealth? Now, uh, fortunately, the COVID scenario in this sense has helped us in the UAE, wherein a number of changes have been brought about last year in the month of November in the UAE penal and civil codes. Uh, that affects basically most of the expats that are living in the UAE. Uh, while we're waiting for the official text on the changes and uh, you know how the coverage of these changes would be in the UAE laws, I think uh, the idea was that UAE needs to be uh, a destination for expatriates to feel comfortable, to feel happy working, happy living without 
taking you know uh, undue you know fear about what happens to their wealth in case something goes wrong and covid times have actually exposed much of this in the last year uh, so what do the changes to laws on inheritance mean for the expat community in the uae uh, just to give you an example until now in some cases if there was an expat who passed away without a will the family of the deceased person would find that the deceased assets were divided as per the sharia law uh, now most of the expats are not used to, to doing that and sometimes you do not you know even favor because the allocations across the spouse the daughter and the son is done in accordance to the sharia law and uh, previously if there was a non muslim expat who failed to specifically petition to the court to apply the home country's laws uh, to their will upon their death if they failed to do that the uae courts would definitely go ahead and apply the sharia law by default which means that there would be some mandatory rules of division on your estate between certain members of the family now this may or may not be aligned with your wishes or what you would expect now with the announced changes we expect that uh, the citizenship of the deceased would dictate how the assets would be divided unless there's a written will uh, which it may itself provide how the distribution of the assets would happen and what law would govern its execution so uh, I, i think this is a very very important step in the right direction for the expat community to feel happy and uh, satisfied that the wealth is taken care of uh, i think what's important here as well is to understand that when we talk about a platform like uh, executive redemption bond portfolio from quilter uh, by the sheer nature that it is based offshore makes us uh, actually not get into that sharia law jurisdiction per se so we are off that sharia law and uh, the beneficiary aspect which i'm sure priyanka will cover at a later stage allows uh, the transfer of wealth in a very very seamless manner without having to uh, you know sell the assets i think you know children grandchildren since the life of the portfolio is 99 years and you know in case the beneficiary takes over the portfolio it again extends to another 99 years so children grandchildren great grand grandchildren can enjoy the benefits of their parents uh, as as such and they decide how they want to encash that wealth so uh, i think in terms of sharia law we are quite okay in the uae uh, i think the middle east is going to imbibe what the uae is doing we can expect that happening very soon uh, but uh, the erb portfolio comes in as a rescue uh, to actually if i may use the word bypass that and uh, feel the freedom of using your wealth and passing it down to the next generation thank you so thank you for that nilam and i think you uh, you brought to uh, to to the forefront two important points one and we'll get to that in just a second i almost forgot about the poll results and i'm sure that uh, all of you are eager to, uh, to the to to see the results the, the conversation was quite engaging and there we have it up on screen who should inherit my assets Uh, uh, a large portion, sixty-nine percent of our audience uh, feel that it is the children, indeed, that should uh, inherit the assets. While twenty-eight uh, percent uh, look at that as the spouse or partner that should, and three uh, percent who believe that they'd like to have charity uh, as well. So uh, interesting. I think uh, that also uh, uh, brings us to uh, our second poll for the for the day and. it is in part uh, something that neelam has referred to when she uh, spoke earlier is uh, about will and do you have a will in place so do uh, do submit your your uh, your feedback on the second poll question as well while we go to priyanka to look at something that uh, neelam touched upon with regard to uh, uh, wills and that is something that is closely linked uh, to the instrument which is uh, beneficiaries uh, we do often nominate beneficiaries within our plans and uh, you know some of the questions that do uh, uh, come in is um, you know what is the difference between a nominee and a beneficiary is the nominee a final beneficiary in an investment plan um, and can we have multiple nominees how do we uh, look and consider and think about these things so priyanka if you can share some insight into into those things i think uh, it will help us Sure. I mean, I agree, Anselm. It's a very valid point raised by Neelam um, about the Sharia law and the offshore. 
Um, so uh, since we are licensed and domiciled out, out of Isle of Man, so obviously that makes our platform offshore. It is a seamless platform. Franka, we uh, lost your audio in the middle for a, for a bit. Uh, if you can sorry. just repeat the last portion. Okay, no, no problem. So I, I'm, I'm just saying that um, we are um, domiciled out, out of Isle of Man. So that makes us offshore. And um, it is very, it's a seamless process in, in the event of the death of a client. Um, first of all, we can have multiple beneficiaries. Yes, um, Anselm, we can have as many as beneficiaries as possible, irrespective. Um, we can have beneficiaries across the world. Doesn't mean that the beneficiary has to live in the UAE. Uh, the beneficiaries can be anywhere. And as I say, that's a very portable platform. Um, so it can be taken anywhere in the world. Obviously, there, is, there would be efficient tax planning required if it is out of UAE and any tax jurisdiction. Um, that is separate. But then, yes, it can be given to anyone. Um, on the event of death, um, um, we pass on, as I say, we pass on the wealth, whatever percentage is given by the policyholder would be passed on as an asset per se to the client, uh, to the beneficiaries. So basically the beneficiary will have a separate account number and he would become, he or she would become the policy owner at that point of time. And then it is the choice of the beneficiary, then now beneficiary, then policyholder is a choice whether he or she would like to continue with the plan or for another 99 years, or would he or she like to sell it and use the um, you know, amount of money to any of their benefits. So it is basically a choice. It is not a compulsion in our case. You would like to take the money or you would like to carry on as a legacy planning, absolutely your choice. So yes, if I, were, if, if I was able to answer your question, you can have multiple beneficiaries and the process of transfer of um, ownership is very, very easy and seamless. Yeah, I think that, that those are both important points that you highlighted and uh, the features that uh, are desirable because uh, in a scenario where uh, if it was like today, uh, you wouldn't want to liquidate assets necessarily at, at, this, at the time. Uh, Absolutely. You would want to wait for an opportunity. So um, uh, it is great that those uh, features and flexibilities are available uh, within the platform. In fact, yeah. Anselm, you know, we have uh, received a couple of, I mean, this is the time when we have received a lot of claims, um, death claims in, in short, and we have seen, um, um, you know, what is happening. And we saw, I mean, this was, this was the right time when we saw in COVID, not actually the right time, it's, it's the wrong time, but unfortunate situation, um, wherein the assets have not performed, obviously, because of the market, there are a few assets which have not performed. And I can imagine if that had to be liquidated today, the hard earned money by the client would have gone at loss, isn't it? So what has happened, so this platform basically gave an opportunity to the next beneficiary to keep the money, wait for the time, grow the money and have their profit booking, and then maybe they have an option to sell it. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, uh, we're going to go to the, the poll results. Uh, I've not, I'm not forgetting it this time around. So if you can have that on screen, do you have a will in place? Uh, a very large 76% of our audience does not have a will in place. Uh, and there are a few gentlemen and ladies uh, from the audience, about 24% who do have a will in place. Um, I think extremely important uh, to, to have a will uh, as, um, as has been sort of pointed out within uh, the discussions, as well as uh, important to nominate, uh, the, uh, to nominate the beneficiaries within the, pro, uh, within the, the plans that you take. Um, all right, we're going to go uh, back to Neelam for a bit. Uh, uh, so with regard to diversification, and uh, you know that's another theme that tends to come across uh, that we tend to come across uh, within uh, many of the events and seminars. Uh, you know, can we diversify? And you know, is do we can we diversify on the platform? What do we look at? Do we trade in stocks, ETF, debt, sec uh, securities? Um, uh, Neelam, if you'd like to give uh, our attendees and viewers a perspective. Um, absolutely, Anselm. I think it's important to diversify uh, all your holdings. Uh, across the open architecture platform that uh, Kulta carries today. Uh, just to give you a background, I think it's very important for us at Continental to understand the risk stability or the risk tolerance a client carries. And we make sure that the client's risk tolerance, um, the number of years that he would want to stay invested, his preferences are managed uh, you know, together to form and customize a portfolio. Uh, when we talk about diversifying, I think Quilter has the widest range today on the ERB platform. 
uh, I heard Priyanka say 55,000 uh, mutual funds and ETFs and uh, 35 stock exchanges and 13 different currencies that a client can hold on. That's a lot. So we at Continental, what we do here is that we identify the top performing assets across these different asset classes, whether it's bonds, equities, commodities, uh, foreign exchange, uh, ETFs, uh, and advise the client in accordance to their uh, needs, in accordance to their objectives that they carry, in accordance to their short-term, medium-term, long-term uh, requirements. So a thorough need analysis is done by us uh, before we step in and create that portfolio. So yes, diversification, absolutely important. Uh, make sure that the asset classes that you carry are not correlated, are actually performing as per your requirement, as per the stated objective in terms of not only returns, but also the uh, tenors. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. To I'm, add to that, yeah. Neelam, what you said, I would like to um, add something which is very interesting. I don't know a lot of our audiences may not be aware of that. Um, um, any one of us who are not a US passport holder um, or a green card holder who has got US CITUS assets, US domicile assets, they are um, to pay an inheritance tax from 18, 1, 8 to 40% of value of value which is above $60,000. Um, so anyone who is in short, what does it mean? Anyone who has got um, assets, I mean, say stocks in, in which are US domicile, a lot of clients I know of who are, um, who has got ESOPs of US, of all the US companies and who has got stocks in US companies, they are not aware of the fact that the moment they, um, buy that and in the event of their death, in, um, they have to pay an inheritance tax, depending on the amount, obviously that there, there is a, there are staggered amount from 18 to 40%, um, which is another an advantage, which our platform offers because um, we are offshore. And remember we ring fence the, um, uh, all the assets. So what happens in this case, uh, the assets are named under the name of Quilter International, which makes, it absolutely out of the inheritance tax. So the clients can actually buy US domicile assets, including stocks, um, um, whatever they want to buy, and they are not liable to inheritance tax in the event of death. I, I wanted to cover that as well. No, I think that's a, that's a massively important point. It absolutely. is, uh, certainly. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. Um, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I interrupted. But uh, is are there anything uh, additional points you would like to make on that? Or uh... no, I I I, I okay. thought because we are talking about investments, um, I, it was a sure. Important point. No, no. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for that. And uh, of course, uh, we are um, a, a reminder. We have gotten a few questions that are, are coming in in the Q and A box. Uh, a reminder to the to the audience that uh, please do submit in your questions and that you'd like to address to the panel. We will be getting into the question and answer session in just about uh, a few minutes. We've got a, a final question, um, a final couple of questions that I'm going to go to. And uh, Priyanka, right over to you in terms of, you know, how do we uh, look at investing in Quilter? Uh, which are the right channels? Uh, you know, do we look at banks? Do we look at brokers? What's the difference? Uh, for our attendees, if they've got this question, how would you address uh, those? Sure. Um, um, so I would, so th th this is what we spoke about um, a little bit about how the product looks like. I will cover the benefits um, in which um, Anselm, your questions would be um, addressed. So what are the key benefits? Obviously, it's a very time efficient uh, platform, as you can see, because um, you can consolidate assets, you can buy anything. So you get a consolidated reporting, um, which is valuation report. Um, you get everything. It's a very transparent valuation report. And obviously, it's very easy to move between assets. So in one dealing instruction form, you can have number of buy and sell in one form. So it is very easy. Um, it's obviously it benefits. I mean, as as it, it's already covered by Neelam, so I don't have to uh, talk much about it. Um, so obviously, you can see the diversification. You can have your own choices. 
um, and then you can transfer existing assets. You have got a buying power of Quilter PLC, which means that there are a couple of mutual funds wherein you get discounted terms, uh, which you will not get. Uh, please mind it that any uh, mutual funds that you buy here are all institutional share classes. So it's the most economical way to buy mutual funds. And that is through our platform. Other than that, there are yet discounted terms. If you need to know more about it, please get in touch with your financial advisors and they'll be able to tell you exactly which are the finance, which, what, which are the discounted mutual funds you can buy. And obviously we have one of the best um, online services, which is called Wealth Interactive, wherein you can um, have access, which you, you can actually have access to 24 seven. Uh, you can view your valuations any point of time. Um, you can see exactly what's happening, your buy, sell charges, you can see everything. So it's a very transparent platform. You can see that. And then lastly, very important question, I'm sure all the clients must be thinking, is my money protected? And this whole circle basically answers that question. As you can see, the middle circle that talks about your cash, bond, shares, and mutual funds, which are your underlying assets. It's ring-fenced by the Isle of Man Insurance Act of 2017 which is a regulated version. And then that is further ring-fenced by Isle of Man Life Assurance Compensation Regulation Act of 1999, 1991, which says that in case any organization, in our case, just giving an example, what if we go bust and bankrupt? What happens to the client's money? As per the Isle of Man Assurance Act of 1991, up to 90% of your um, investment amount, I mean, of your um, fund value, would be given back to you as an, um, as an act of 1991. So your money is very secured with us. And to ring fence that we are once again regulated by FSA, which is Financial uh, Services Secure uh, Authority. So your money is in a very stable um, jurisdiction in short. Um, to which comes a very, a very important part. Um, I understand that all the clients who are here would be banking somewhere in the local banks or in the international banks. You will have your salary account, you will have your business account. Just to give you a snapshot as to how uh, are we different from a banking platform, because I'm sure you would be having a question in your mind that um, what we are giving are bankable assets, even banks would do the same thing. So how are we different? Um, don't get me wrong, banks are good as well. It's just to give you a synopsis of the charges, what they charge vis-a-vis -vis our charge. And these are the charges. Our charges are through uh, Continental. So obviously, um, this applies to your advisors. So um, banks, you can see dealing charge. When I talk about dealing charge, any bonds or mutual funds you want to buy through banking platform, the charges ranges from 1% to 2.5% of your face value. And sell is 0.5%. So anything you want to sell would be 0.5% and buy would range from 1% to 2.5%. With um, ERB, which is our in, um, uh, executive redemption bond, it is as low as 17 pounds. So if you want to do $100,000 or if you want to do a million dollars, doesn't matter, we will charge you only 17 pounds for buy and sell either. Um, assets are held onshore, as you know, as Neelam covered Sharia, so obviously um, your assets are all held in the UAE onshore, but with us, the assets are held offshore. Uh, custody charges um, in the uh, banks in UAE and international banks as well ranges from 30 bips to 75 bips. With us, it is as low as 0.04% to up to 0.1% based on the country um, of the assets. So uh, these are the basic differences between a banking platform and our platform, um, other than um, obviously various aspects uh, which we covered today, legacy planning, uh, trust planning, taxations, and then uh, US domicile assets, uh, portability, um, flexibility, other than these, I thought that it is very important for all the clients to know what are you paying to the banks. And vis-a-vis -vis, if you go through continental um, executive redemption bond, um, what are you going to pay? So I think um, that's it. Um, any questions, Anselm, over yep. to you. Uh, no, thank you for that. And I think we're uh, almost out of time, but we've got time for a few questions. Uh, so we're going to go straight up uh, to a poll uh, from, the, from the team. And while the poll is being answered, we can take the audience question. Uh, so the, the poll is with relation to family business. Can legacy planning help to keep the family business intact? And we'll get our response uh, from our audience members on that. 
the first question that we've got, uh, which is coming up on screen, uh, for, is with relation to our um, uh, transfer of wealth and uh, the implications it has uh, with regard to tax uh, for the beneficiaries. So um, I will uh, 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 put that up to our uh, or, uh, to our panelist, um, and if uh, either uh, uh, Akshay or Neelam, one of you or one of you would like to take that question. Um, just just quickly from from my perspective, there are always going to be tax implications depending on where the beneficiaries are at the time when you need to make that wealth tra wealth transfer. So first thing as a disclaimer, please consult your tax advisor. Uh, they are the experts, they are the specialists depending on the jurisdiction. But what I do know is that these solutions do offer the flexibility based on the structure, the trust, the offer of uh, opportunity of extending the policy depending on where the beneficiary is. So to give, to give an example, if my beneficiary today is in a jurisdiction where there is a big tax implication, instead of being paid out and that wealth being attached to the estate and then being taxable or creating a taxable event, it can continue in the plan and maintain that level of tax efficiency. So while not touting to be an expert of any sort on the tax implications at the time of wealth transfer, which is very, very important, uh, these solutions give us the flexibility to optimize and mitigate the tax liabilities at the time. Uh, I hope that's so. So I'm not getting too technical, but yes, you, they they do offer tax efficiencies because the, because of that flexibility. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Akshay. I think uh, uh, a good question, and uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, there is a need for uh, specificity with regard to the advice. Um, our next uh, question uh, uh, that we've got from the audience, um, and we're going to get it up on screen uh, right about now, so that we can get one of our panelists to answer it. Um, the question is, how does legacy transfer work in joint ownership? So when, uh, when there's a joint ownership of assets, how, how do we look at legacy transfer uh, in that scenario? And again, I will go to uh, Priyanka or Neelam, if one of you would like to answer that. Um, sure. Uh, so, sorry. So in, in case of uh, joint ownership, um, obviously um, in our case, if the client, um, if one of the policy holder in the event of one of the death of one of the policy holder, the beneficiary um, gets the, um, amount of money that is given as a share. So it is in our case, so as for example, if, if it is um, husband, wife for joint policy holder and the son and the daughter are the beneficiaries, the, if in the event of the death of the husband, I'm just giving an example, or the wife, whosoever, the amount, say 100,000 in that case, that would be distributed to uh, the, husband, the children at that point of time in the event of the death. The wife yet, is a policyholder, and in the later case, the children becomes policyholder as well. Obviously, the age has to be above 18; otherwise, uh, the mother can always oversee that and become an ass assignee to the policy. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, answering that, uh, Priyanka, and I'm sure that that has helped. Uh, we have a few more questions. Like, uh, like I'd like to remind our attendees, uh, we've got a couple of minutes more. So uh, we are going to uh, look at, okay, there's another question up on screen. Uh, transfer of money to culture account is very tedious process and costly if you transfer to the UK. If you transfer to UAE bank online or check deposit requires financial advisor to be involved and credit takes 10 to 15 days from the check deposit. Uh, this process needs to be improved. So it's more of a feedback and uh, thank you for your question. So um, uh, we will look at uh, and take in your suggestions. Uh, there are uh, there are dependencies that that are there on multiple partners, but I'm sure that both uh, the team at Quilter and Continental will uh, take your feedback and look uh, to improve uh, that. Um, the poll results. I think uh, if we can have the poll results on screen, 
so that we can um, uh, look at the last one from the, yep. Yeah, so, oh, okay, the, I think unanimously everyone agrees that yes, it can help keep the family business intact. So thank you for that. We've got time for, I think, one last question uh, from, from the audience. I'd like to remind you that, uh, and while the team puts it up on screen, I'd like to remind you that do leave your question in on uh, in the chat box. If you're not able to get to it today, uh, uh, we will send you a response post the webinar by email, uh, but uh, do submit your questions and we assure you that we will get back to you. Um, yep. Uh, if we can have the question up on a screen, it's a question by one of our audience members with regard to um, the services being offered in India. Uh, is the service offered in India and can the same plan be continued in India? Uh, I am going to uh, again go back to Neelam and Priyanka uh, for, uh, for this. Would one of you like to, uh, ladies, like to answer that? I can, okay, I, okay, Please. fine, I'll, I'll address that. Um, we can, um, obviously, um, there are restrictions um, as per Indian law, we would follow um, the restrictions of Indian law, you know, there are restrictions of what amount of money can be invested offshore. So we can, um, it's not a no, um, though there are a couple of terms and conditions applied. Can this be continued in India? Can, we, can that be taken to India? Obviously, um, based on the uh, tax planning part, once again, it can be, once again, when, when, you, when you ask about portability, you need to understand um, a lot of implications of the law of the land. So if you take the money back to India, there would be tax implications. Uh, there would not be tax implications, I'm sorry. So that's one of the reasons why you cannot take it back. You need to redeem it in uh, the UAE and then obviously you can take the money tax-free back to India. I think I would like to add here, Priyanka, I think that's the benefit that we carry while living in the UAE, isn't it? The flexibility, the customization that can be offered by, Absolutely. you know, platforms like uh, Quilter today. Uh, going back to India, I think a lot of clients do have investment opportunities, which are offered by a lot of Indian platforms. But I would want to urge our clients, our uh, you know, audience to have a look at this platform while you're in UAE, take all the benefits that are possible. And uh, we never know what kind of a world we would come into tomorrow. So while here, take advantage of the uh, facility that is available, uh, make maximum use of it, reach out to us, and we would be able to help you, guide you through the entire process. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm sorry, one, one, one. Yes. Uh, yes. In case the person, he's an NRI and goes back to India, today the laws, I think, for seven years allow him to retain his bank account and funds, etc., outside India. Yeah. So, but he has to declare all the, all the funds and investments that he has when he goes back to India. But he has the option of retaining all his bank accounts and investments outside India for a given period. However, we would still, uh, like Ansla was saying, Akshay was saying that we must take uh, professional uh, advice from the tax people. But yeah, the, the plan is portable and you don't have to surrender as soon as you go back to India. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for Thank sharing you. that. And uh, that's, I think uh, that's all the time we've got for a question and answer perspective. Um, I'd like to get one final, uh, you know, a short 30 second uh, view from each of our panelists before uh, we conclude. So if uh, you'd like to summarize and probably give uh, a takeaway to our audience members, um, I'm going to start with, uh, uh, with you, uh, Mr. Ashok. So if you could give us a quick synopsis, summary, your thoughts on uh, legacy for our audience. No, I, I don't have to give anything. The audience gave 100% of the, of the poll that we received that everyone believes in legacy planning. So so we are all on the same page. On the same Let's page. go out yeah. and start implementing, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Akshay, uh, we'll go to you. I, I think we got into a lot of detail today. Thank you to everyone who's uh, for participating. But I think my main takeaway is, let's make sure we're having the right conversations now. Let's make sure we're utilizing the tools that are at our disposal to structure a sustainable, flexible, multi-generational legacy plan. Because um, if we're not, we will 
you know, we're setting ourselves up for failure in the future. We should be doing this now. And again, referring back to those two points I made, 70% of families lose their wealth in the second generation due to improper planning. And right now we're living through the largest transfers of wealth in history. There are a lot of opportunities to capitalize on some of the tools, which we went into the details, the benefits of those tools, the flexibility. It's, it, it, it's not difficult. It's not difficult to do and come talk to us. All the facets that I mentioned, uh, we can cover all of those points and let's at least begin the conversation. Uh, and thank you to everyone for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. That. Very well said. Uh, okay. Uh, Priyanka? Um, there is no uh, right or wrong, wrong time to do legacy <laughs> or invest. Um, if you have not, uh, please ask yourself this question. Uh, what are you waiting for? Uh, what is the right time? Um, I think that's a question you should ask yourself. And I, I think that's it for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Priyanka. And uh, Neelam? Uh, well, I think uh, difficult. I'm sorry, your microphone is muted. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, difficult times today. Uh, we all as individuals refrain from having such conversations within our families as to what happens if I'm no more. Uh, I think it's been uh, challenging for a lot of people, having lost a lot of near and dear ones. It's the right time to have this conversation. Think about your children. Think about your future generations. Safeguard what you've done. Preserve your wealth. And if you have any questions, if you want any guidance, Definitely, we are there to support each and every one of you. So reach out to us. We're more than happy to provide that information. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone, for joining in, especially our attendees. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. We hope that we were able to provide you with insight and, uh, uh, and value in today's session. Um, of course, uh, thank you to each and every one of our panelists uh, for, 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 again, sharing their time, their experience, and their knowledge with us. Thank you uh, to our team behind the scenes who helped uh, make this event a seamless one. For those of you that have, uh, that have not had their questions answered, like I mentioned, uh, we will send across an email with a response to your question. Um, and we hope to uh, see you and uh, hope that you will continue to uh, attend our events that we put together. So for this evening, thank you very much to each and every one of you and hope to catch up with you sometime soon. Um, do leave your views on the poll at the exit. Uh, we would definitely uh, appreciate your feedback. Have a great evening. And thank you very much once again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great thank night. You, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.